Far out at sea, the crew of the Emma have lost their way. Carried off course by an unexpected tempest, they finally manage to make landfall in a place unlike any other. It is an islet of impossibilities, a fragment of the ocean floor thrust to the surface, scattered with ruins that don't appear to be of human origin. As they navigate the Cyclopean masonry, trying to understand this strange place, some of them vanish into the bizarre geometry of it, lost forever to the odd, unobservable angles within the stonework. The place is more than confusing. It literally doesn't make sense. Soon, amid all this strangeness, they find a great stone door, which, of course, they make the mistake of opening. What emerges from it cannot be described. There is no language for such abysms of shrieking and immemorial lunacy, such eldritch contradictions of all matter, force, and cosmic order. A mountain walked or stumbled. God, the thing of the idols, the green, sticky spawn of the stars, had awakened to claim his own. After vigintillions of years, great Cthulhu was loose again, and ravening for delight. These sailors have found a fragment of the corpse city, Rilie, where an eldritch god lay dead and dreaming, waiting for this precise moment to return to the waking world. They couldn't have known, even seeing it now, they can't. It defies their capacity for understanding. To be honest, not even I can tell you what they really saw. Not even after reading this story countless times, after seeing all the many versions of this monster artists have rendered since Lovecraft first wrote The Call of Cthulhu almost a century ago, I just couldn't say. Like, literally, I could not do it, even if I had seen the thing firsthand. Because, as familiar as we all probably are by now with our favorite, great, big, green, winged, tentacle-mouthed, ship-battling old one, that's not really what this thing is. That's just how some cultists tried and failed to render it in the story. It's not even the mountain that walked or stumbled, the green, sticky star spawn that Lovecraft himself described. It can't be those things, because the first thing we're told is that it cannot be described. Cthulhu was never some monster for story protagonists to fight, for artists to render. It's not even Cthulhu, really. The name itself falls short. It's something far more terrifying than that. It is the ineffable, the thing which cannot be named. The unnameable, the ineffable, the indescribable, this thing that shows up in so much of Lovecraft's work, but also throughout the whole of experience, especially art. As we waded out into the shallows of this topic, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, it quickly became apparent why so many of Lovecraft's characters go mad when they're confronted with this stuff. The ineffable is not an easy thing to approach. It's not even an easy thing to begin to approach, and I don't mean approach the way that the crew of the Emma approached Cthulhu. This is a very different kind of sea we're paddling out into, one far darker, far harder to navigate. Where words fail, one must find other means. Think about divinity, infinity, experiences so strange they cannot be related, emotions so poignant they cannot be meaningfully expressed. What do you do with these things? If not with language, how do you describe them? Can you? Even if you can, should you? Do you really need to? And if so, should you be the one doing it? Is this the domain of scientists and philosophers, or of dreamers and artists? Is this all really a valiant quest for the truth? Or is it an absurd, pretentious pursuit driven by a deep-seated inability to accept your own limitations as a rational being? We're probably underqualified to give good answers to most of these questions, but we do, at least, have a starting place. The question we ended up asking is, what does it even mean for something to be ineffable? It's easy just to treat ineffable as synonymous with indescribable, but 
it's really not that simple. Because can't all things technically be described, even if badly or inaccurately? You can say that bananas are blue and that would be a description, just a wrong one. You can call Cthulhu a big monster, but that will never capture what it actually is. You can tell a blind person that the color red looks like a rose, but that's not really going to bring them any closer to understanding, is it? And that's just it. That's the mistake I think we made at first, and the one I think most other people make when they're approaching this subject. Affability is not some quality that an object has. It's about your ability to understand. Your ability to describe in a way that creates understanding. Think of it this way. Your mind is a library full of books. A description is a query that you give to the reference desk, and you get some relevant titles back. Ask for an apple, and your library will pull the book containing all the images and experiences you have pertaining to apples. You can fan through all the pages to find reference points, create a context for what apples are, what they do, what they mean. That's understanding. But now you've seen something with no name. Something that your library has no books for. No matter what query you give the reference desk, whatever description you use, there is nothing in the library that can create the same understanding for you. This is the ineffable. The empty space on the shelf. The dark sea in the mind. We see the indescribable every day. Scientists are constantly whittling that away. It's just common sense that anything observable must also be rational, which means that, with enough effort, we can describe it. We attempt to fill the empty shelf. We erect lighthouses along the shores of reason to ward off the darkness. But the ineffable? That's something far bigger and far more frightening. Something the rational mind, eager to describe and thus understand, strains against. A few years before he wrote The Call of Cthulhu, Lovecraft wrote another story called The Nameless City. It begins with an explorer who finds his way down into a forgotten temple hidden deep beneath the sands of the Arabian desert. He descends into the darkness, torch held out in front of him like a protective ward. The further he goes, the stranger it feels to him. The unknown passage led infinitely down like some hideous haunted well, and the torch I held above my head could not light the unknown depths toward which I was crawling. And then, something changes. The first major decision he makes in the story is to investigate the ruins. The second occurs when he finds himself plunged into complete darkness. I was still scrambling down interminably when my failing torch died out. I do not think I noticed it at the time, for when I did notice, I was still holding it high above me as if it were ablaze. I think for most people, the obvious response to this turn of events would be to leave? To turn and flee from the engulfing darkness? But something within our narrator will not allow him to do that. He continues to feel his way through the pitch black, using his imagination to visualize the strange alien world he's entering as it passes under his trembling fingertips. There's still more of the story I need to share with you, but you can already begin to see a metaphor taking shape here. This story is a window on humanity standing before the ineffable. If we think of the torch as the light of rational understanding, the ability to use observation and rationality to see things accurately, then it's not hard to see what the darkness is. That which lies beyond. The unknown. Of course, the torch is the tool you use to banish this darkness. But what happens when… it… fails? What happens when the tools you rely on to navigate and understand your reality no longer work? This is what it means to confront the ineffable. This is how it can feel. And when rationality fails you, you have the same choice as the explorer. Do you run from it? Label it as an unknowable and scramble away back toward the light? Or do you press on, into the dark? To me, one of the most interesting parts of this conversation is the fact that so often, people don't just turn away from the darkness. I said a minute ago that the obvious response would be to leave. I think that's true, 
But I also think there's an even stronger urge that makes people stay despite that internal reaction. I think there's a reason so many people try to write about or depict ineffable beings like Cthulhu, why poets and artists try to put language and pigment to things like emotion. Perhaps, more than familiarity or comfort, humans want power. A little over a year ago, we made a video about true names, which is a type of magic that shows up in a lot of stories. There's a lot of fun, mystical ideas in that video, but one of the core concepts is this. When you know something's true name, not just a descriptive term for it, but an accurate, encapsulating term, you can control it. To a certain extent, that's also true in real life. A name is a symbol that allows you to reduce the thing, reference it simply, it allows you to capture the identity of something much larger in just a few syllables. In a way, pretty much all language is like that. To describe something in words is to give it a name, to encapsulate it, make it small, give yourself some power over it. And maybe this is why people press on through the darkness, why they try to describe the ineffable, try to name the unnameable. I think it's natural to resist the idea that there are things which you will never be able to put into words, capture with a simple set of symbols. Not knowing the name of a thing means you have no power over it, and I think humans have a hard time accepting that. So much so, in fact, that you would rather grasp around in the pitch darkness than turn back and leave the thing unknown. Ultimately, I think it's a very understandable impulse. To be a sentient being in a cosmos where sentience seems to mean very little is unnerving. Easy to feel as though you're adrift on a black and shifting ocean. Of course you want to find some sources of light, gather what information you can, understand as much as possible. But of course, the light of rationality can only shine so far. Thus, our intrepid explorer finds himself grasping his way through the impenetrable darkness feeling this new world with his hands, and, strangely, it begins to work. The surfaces in the dark slowly begin to reveal themselves through a dim, barely perceptible phosphorescence. What he sees in that pseudo-light, he can hardly fathom. Glass cases full of mummified corpses, lavishly robed, bedecked with jewels, and entirely alien. The best word he can think of to describe them is reptile but he knows it's pathetically inadequate for the strangeness before him. As he follows the growing light, he discovers a staircase. At its bottom, nothing. No, not nothing. Blindness. More absolute than the dark. The path descends into an abyss of uniform radiance. Through it, he can just see the outline of a doorway from which this strange light is emanating. A moan reverberates from beyond the threshold, like the voices of distant, condemned spirits. Now, in the face of this second light, more powerful than a thousand torches, more horrible than the darkness itself, he really is thinking about turning back and leaving. But it's too late. A strong wind is suddenly pulling him in toward the door, toward the gaping maw of the light. As he draws near, he catches sight of something within the radiance. I saw outlined against the luminous ether of the abyss what could not be seen against the dusk of the corridor. A nightmare horde of rushing devils, hate distorted, grotesquely panoplied, half transparent, devils of a race no man might mistake, the crawling reptiles of the nameless city. And then, in an instant, the wind dies away and the door slams shut sparing him the egress into the world of the second light and plunging him back into darkness. A darkness now, perhaps, more comforting. Shaken, horrified, he climbs back out to the desert. But the light of day will never feel the same to him again. It's uncomfortable to stand in the dark. When rationality fails, humans tend not to throw down the oars but to default instead to other modes of description, creativity, imagination, vagary, and this is actually how I like to interpret that second light. In the end, it's not his torch which illuminates the strangeness, the nightmare, 
It's this otherworldly radiance shining from a place no human can fully comprehend. One way to read this story is that the nameless city is really a warning, a demonstration of human limitations, a caution against straying beyond the bounds of rationality, against letting the imagination take control in our quest to name the unnameable, to put words to the ineffable. As we imagine this tiny, frail explorer crawling back out from the mouth of madness, shaken, mind ruined, I think we can say one thing for sure, perhaps he shouldn't have done that. Maybe his meager torch was never meant to carry him into those lightless depths. And perhaps yours isn't either? Perhaps you should retreat when the darkness sets in, when the light of rationality gutters. In his 17th century essay concerning human understanding, John Locke wrote that, Our business here is not to know all things, but those which concern our conduct. If we can find out those measures whereby a rational creature may and ought to govern his opinions and actions depending thereon, we need not be troubled that some other things escape our knowledge. Basically, he takes the position that it's okay if some things elude your grasp, as long as you can understand the things which are actionable and meaningful to you as a rational person. Even in one of Lovecraft's own stories, appropriately titled The Nameless, there's a very meta moment when one of the characters remarks that constant talk about unnameable and unmentionable things is a very puerile device, quite in keeping with a lowly standard as an author. So maybe this whole thing artists and writers do, this straining against, this trying to name, this effort to describe the ineffable, is a bit misplaced. Maybe it's not transcendent or cool. Maybe it's just absurd. Isn't it a little arrogant, after all, for an artist to believe that their inexact craft can somehow uncover things which the rigorous methods of science and philosophy cannot? When you try to do this, are you just deluding yourself, pretending to be able to give language and form to things that you don't actually understand? Worse still, is this attempt actually going to lead you further from the truth? Threaten you with the same fate that almost befell the character in the story, thrusting you into a realm you cannot comprehend or navigate? Is the right thing to just give up? Well, that may not actually even be your decision to make. After he escapes the nameless city, our explorer leaves the strangeness of the underground temple, the light, the creatures, everything about the journey behind, except for the memories. In reality, the ineffable is not so tidy. It's not some optional side quest you can just complete or skip. It's not separated from the rest of the cosmos by a literal door. There are many ineffable things which you can perhaps ignore. You may never see the face of God. You may never unravel the ontological question behind how the universe came to be. And you know, those things don't have to trouble you. You probably still have other things to do, art to make, taxes to pay. But there's one ineffable you can't really ignore. Death. I'm sorry to take it here, but it's part of human existence. Just as the wind carries the explorer toward the light, so too is each and every person born ever closer to that unknowable place beyond their own mortality. And for them, no stone door will snap shut at the last instant. There will be no comfortable daylight, or even comfortable darkness, to return to. So, here you are, in the dark, born toward the radiant abyss. Here you are with all of that powerlessness. Here you are, disarmed, torch snuffed, words wilted on your tongue. Rationality has failed you. But what about creativity? I don't think Locke and Lovecraft are entirely wrong. I think there may be an element of hubris, of arrogance, in attempting to use art to name the unnameable. Science and philosophy give you boundaries. They use rationality and experience to identify and develop reference points. Lighthouses built on the shores of reason, shining out against the blackness. But what happens when no rational reference point exists? When that book is missing from the library? What then? Sometimes these tools simply cannot furnish the answers you need, or at least not when you need them. You can make no description. 
you remain blind, lost. No matter how they try, no one can navigate an infinite ocean of sameness. To understand and function within your reality, you need those reference points and boundaries. Sometimes you require a second light. And it doesn't have to be a horrific, all-consuming thing that threatens to swallow you up if you approach it. When you use art and fiction to describe the indescribable, you don't literally have to delude yourself into thinking that whatever your pen writes or your brush renders, the universe truly is. Words are the writer's tools, and seeking to describe the ineffable, to give language to these things, discover the boundaries of their tools, is the writer's business. In the words of Ursula K. Le Guin, it is a writer's job to write what cannot be said. Art is how you use your creativity to choose and create your own reference points. With it, you create your own light. You are allowed to look at the scattering of stars over an otherwise dark and featureless sea and to choose the shapes and constellations you will follow. A second light beyond those that call you back to shore. A way to navigate the darkness all your own. And who knows what you may find. Okay, we have been through the land of darkness and unnameable things. Now go off and find your own way through the strange darkness of your creativity. Or, in simpler words, keep making stuff up. Bye! <laughs>